This is a 2006 Lamborghini Murcielago Roadster, and it's just ridiculous. Modern Lamborghini models have gotten more user-friendly, more high-tech, easier to drive, and frankly, that's a good thing compared to some of the old-school, ridiculously impractical Lamborghinis from years ago. But to me, the Murcielago was the last of the really crazy Lamborghinis, and today I'm going to review this one. I've borrowed this Murcielago Roadster from Mark Motors here in Bernie, Texas, in the San Antonio area. Mark Motors has a fantastic inventory full of luxury cars and exotic cars and performance cars, and they gave me free reign to choose basically anything I wanted to in order to film a video with. And I chose the Murcielago Roadster because it is very much worthy of having its quirks and features revealed because there are a lot of them. First, a little overview. Now, the Lamborghini Murcielago came out all the way back in 2002, replacing the Diablo in Lamborghini's lineup. And early Murcielago models used a 6.2 liter V12 with about 570 horsepower. The original Murcielago was a coupe, but then eventually they came out with this, the open roof Roadster, which was even more ridiculous. All the Murcielagos were all-wheel drive, and you could get a six-speed manual transmission or an automatic transmission with paddle shifters that Lamborghini called E-Gear, which is what this car has. Now, to be clear, I already filmed a video with a Murcielago LP640 Coupe, but that was years ago, before I got as detailed and as in-depth as I do now. And plus, that was a whole different animal. The LP640 came later, it was more modern, it had more power, and of course, the Coupe had a fixed roof unlike the Roadster. Now, the LP640 was followed up in Lamborghini's line by the Murcielago SV, which itself was followed up later by the Aventador. But today I'm gonna to take a look at this earlier Murcielago Roadster, and I'm going to show you all of the quirks and features of the last real old school Lambo before they got more modern, high-tech, user-friendly, and, you know, rational. Then I'm gonna get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Murcielago Roadster, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer, where I've also rounded up a list of the most expensive convertibles currently listed for sale on Autotrader. All right, I'm going to start the myriad of bizarre quirks and features of this car by discussing some of the strange beeping sounds that it makes. Now, if you walk up to the car and it is locked and you press the unlock button on the key fob, it makes this sound. Okay, that's fine, but if you try to lock it, things get a little bit stranger. It makes three weird tones, and it locks the car after the first one and before the second one. Take a listen. Okay, so when you hear those beeping noises, you already know things with this car are going to be a little unorthodox, and that trend continues when you start opening stuff. I'm gonna start with the doors. Now to open up the door, there's this little panel on the top of the door that functions as a door handle. You push down on the circular part at the front of the panel, and then the door comes up. We call these scissor doors, or as I prefer, Lambo doors, you know, because Lambos have them, and they're a lot cooler than the doors you get in a normal car. Now, next up, before I move on to the interior of the Murcielago, where it has most of its bizarre quirks and features, I want to continue the theme of opening stuff, starting with the engine compartment. Now, to open the engine compartment, you have a little latch here in the driver's door jam, this little silver latch. You pull it, and it unlatches the engine compartment. Then you just come back here, and you open it up backwards. Yes, that's right. The engine compartment cover in this car is hinged in the back, and that means it opens, well, you can see backwards, which actually I think is a really good idea, because if you're looking to do servicing or maintenance on your engine, all you have to do to access it is reach over your expensive Italian exotic car panels with your wrenches and your tools and your fluids and your dirty rags, thereby risking dropping something on your expensive paint and your quarter panel every time you access your engine. This is the kind of well thought out design that you can only get 
in an Italian supercar. Now, next up, another quirk of opening things in the Murcia Lago. Let's pretend you just want to load your briefcase into the front trunk. It's been a long day at the office, you just want to stick your briefcase in the trunk and be gone. In a normal car, you would just walk up, press a little trunk button on the key fob, the trunk would open, and you'd stick your briefcase in, but not in the Murcia Lago. Instead, you have to walk up and unlock the door. Then you got to open up the door, do the whole scissor door thing, and now a crowd starts to form. Oh, who's this cool guy with the cool Lambo and the cool doors? And you're like, I just want to load in my briefcase. Then you're not done. You have to reach under the dashboard and the driver footwell, find the latch to unlatch the front trunk. Then you have to go all the way around to the front trunk and unlatch it like the engine compartment in a normal car. And only then can you stick in your briefcase case, turning the simple process of opening the trunk to put something in it into this large showy display, the joys of Lambo ownership. But when it comes to opening, closing, removing stuff in this car, there is nothing crazier than the roof. This is not just an open car, it has a roof, and the roof is this. It is this large, rather heavy black canvas panel with all this bracing on the inside, and installing it is a rather complicated job, not suitable for just one person. Now, when this car was new, it was over $300,000, and it didn't have a power retractable roof like everything else. Instead, you paid all that money, you got the cool Lambo, and when it started to rain, you were, you were doing one of these. <laughs> asking some friend or passerby on the street, can you, can you help me get the toupee on my Murcielago Roadster? I'm not going to do it because frankly, it seems to be way too complicated and ridiculous, but if you wanted to, you could. <laughs> Now, next we move on to the interior of the Murcielago Roadster, where there are a lot of bizarre quirks and features that I'm going to show to you. But actually, I'm going to start with something on the outside of the car. You can see this little intake on the outside. This is supposed to move. It's supposed to go up and down, I guess, to allow air into the engine. Now, Murcielago is the Spanish word for bat. And so people came to call these the bat wings, because they're on both sides of the car, and they could raise up or down. And the cool part is they don't just raise up or down automatically. Instead, you can push a button in the center console to raise them or lower them to look cool at your whim. Now, unfortunately, these commonly broke, so a lot of owners just had them installed fixed in the up position, but that was the theory. These little bat wings could go up or down, and you could push a button to make it happen. Now, next up, we move on to the transmission in this car, and as you can see, it's a paddle shifter. It has nice yellow shift paddles to match the exterior. Obviously, with the paddles, you can go through all the gears, but you can't go into reverse. So you're thinking, well, how do you get this car into reverse? Well, of course, you look in the middle here, and you will see three buttons where the gear lever would be. You have sport on the left, on the right you have the button that turns off stability control, and in the middle you have a blank. It does nothing. So where's reverse? Well, that would be to the left of the steering wheel. There's a set of buttons over there, and one of them is reverse. Now you're thinking, why didn't Lamborghini just make the blank button in the middle reverse? That would make the most sense. That's where gear levers usually are. Why not just stick reverse there? Well, of course that would make the most sense, and of course they didn't do it. And by the way, in that little center non-transmission area, the sport button, why does this car have a sport button? It's a 570 horsepower V12 crazy looking Lamborghini without a roof. Do they really think people are gonna get in and be like, you know, I think I want to drive it in non-sport mode today. Now, next up in the center console, next to the non-reverse button, you have the power mirror controls, and they're pretty standard, just normal power mirror controls like you'd see in a normal car. But one thing about these mirrors, though, is I always loved how they look, this low, flat, horizontal shape that stuck out from the car. I think this is one of the few cars that has really managed to make the mirror into a style element, not just a functional element. It looks really cool. It really looks like it belongs in this car. The funny thing with the mirrors in this car, though, over on the passenger side, where it says objects and mirror are closer than they appear, it's crooked. You can see they tried to get it to go along the bottom line of the mirror, but they didn't quite make it work, and it isn't even throughout the entire bottom line. Ah, Lamborghini. Now, next we move on to another 
interesting detail in this car. Because this is an open car, they couldn't exactly mount the dome lights or the map lights on the roof, so instead they stuck them here between the two seats. And you can see next to the map lights, you have little buttons to turn them on, one for each light. But what if you want to turn them both on at the same time? Well, that button is to the left of the steering wheel next to the button for the parking lights and the fog lights on the outside of the car. You press that button and then the two map lights go on at the same time. Or you press these buttons individually to turn them on. And speaking of strange placements, take a look on the door panel and you can see the power window switch. Except that isn't the power window switch, that's the power lock switch placed exactly where you'd expect the power window switch to be. Instead, the power window switches are in the middle next to the yellow non-transmission lever thing. Very counterintuitive placement of those items. Another interesting placement in this car is the seat belts because they don't come out from the pillar by the doors. Instead, they come out from the middle. So it's kind of a weird feeling you sit in the driver's seat in this car and you reach over your right shoulder to buckle the seat belt. A little strange, but typical of this car. Another counterintuitive placement in this car, you're looking for the cigarette lighter, you won't find it in the center console. Instead, it's right here to the right of the steering wheel near where the ignition is. Haven't really seen that before in a lot of cars, but uh, this isn't a lot of cars. Same story with the parking brake, also rather counterintuitive. Not in the middle, instead it's between the driver's seat and the door, which is a strange placement, although in fairness to Lambo, it is fairly common in exotic cars, especially older ones, to put the parking brake there. Now, the problem with putting the parking brake there is that if you have the parking brake up or engaged, it's gonna block your entry and exit and make it harder for you to get in and out of the car. So, in this car and in other cars with parking brakes like this, once you engage the parking brake, you can put it down. So it can be down and on. <laughs> In order to take it off, you pull it back up again, then you push in the button, then you push it down, and then it goes off. Kind of complicated, but actually you get used to it. Now, next up, I want to talk about storage in this car, which is obviously limited. You have no storage on the door panels because when the doors go up, stuff would just fly out. You also have no glove box, but you do have some storage compartments in this car. One is in the center console under this little leather panel. You open it and there's some storage. The other is behind the seats. There's a little netting behind the seats where you can put stuff and on both sides, there's a little vertical netting that almost looks like it's intended to be a cup holder. It would hold like a can or a bottle, like maybe a Red Bull while you drive. I'm not sure if that's the intent, but it could be a makeshift cup holder in the Murcielago using a net behind the seats. And next up, we move on to another unusual item in this car, and that would be the sun visors which are rather small. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that. Put down the sun visor and you'll see it's actually smaller than the interior rear view mirror. There are not too many cars where you'll find the sun visor is smaller than the rear view mirror. Now, next we move on to the center control stack. And if you take a look at the center control stack, you'll see that the radio is on display, but there's no climate controls. To access the climate controls, you have to push up on this carbon fiber panel that says Lamborghini, and that brings you to your climate controls, or you can hide them if for some reason you want to do that. Now, one thing I like about the climate controls is the fact that on the recirculating air button, you can see there's a diagram, not just of a generic car, but of this car, a Murcielago. I really like that. It's a nice little piece of attention to detail. Now, I could get into the fact that it makes no sense to have a recirculating air button in a car that effectively has no usable roof, but I'm gonna skip that, we'll just move on. Now, one thing I absolutely love about this interior is the fact that in spite of all of the insanity I just told you about, the weird opening stuff, all the strange placement of everything, of course, the crazy look of this car, you can see the gauge cluster is just normal. It uses a normal font. It looks like the kind of thing you would expect to see in a Honda Accord. There's nothing exciting or unusual or interesting or thrilling about it at all. It just looks like one of the most boring gauge clusters you will ever see, despite the fact that everything else in this car is crazy and ridiculous. Now, finally, you might be wondering how you get out of this thing when you're in it. And actually, it's pretty simple. There is a little silver latch on the door panel. You simply pull on it, that unlatches the door, and then you have to push up in the direction that the door would go. 
you just open it from there and you climb out. Not really all that difficult. And since the doors are up, it gives me a chance to comment on another rather interesting quirk of the Murcielago, and that is the fact that in the door jam it says Murcielago, and every single letter is capitalized except the R. <laughs> They did a lowercase r. Not sure why, not sure why they chose the r, not sure why they mixed that, but uh, they did. Now, next up, moving on to the outside of this car, the angle that you're looking at right now is my very favorite angle of this car because you can see just how flat this shape is going down the entire windshield and coming up the front trunk. It's just one flat wedge shape, and I absolutely love how that looks. Modern cars don't really do this all that much anymore, even supercars, but this car did, and so did some of its Lamborghini predecessors, and it is a very cool look. And in order to pull it off, it meant that they had to integrate the headlights into this flat wedge-shaped panel, and I have always loved the look of the headlight housing in this car. You can see it has these two circles in it for the lights and the high beams. The shape of it is just totally alien compared to basically any other car. It's really cool. Now, next up, another noteworthy item on the outside of this car is the wheels. I have always loved this wheel design because these wheels are different and yet the same. If you look at them, they share the same design, but the rear wheel is way wider to accommodate the rear tire. So while the front wheel is flat, the rear wheel kind of curves in and it looks different yet keeps the same look. I've always thought that was cool. These are some of my favorite wheels on the Murcielago, although I actually preferred the wheels on the first generation, the very earliest cars in 02 and 03. Most people change out the wheels on the Murcielago for aftermarket stuff, but I think that's a mistake. This car had a lot of great stock wheels, and you just don't see them all that often because there are so many aftermarket options. But these are very cool, very fitting with the car. Another item I've always found interesting on the outside of this car is the brake lights, which are really, really simple. They're just in a line brake light, turn signal, reverse light. Modern Lambos have these cool like Y-shaped brake lights that point in the direction that you're turning, whatever. They look really cool. In this thing, the brake lights look like they could have come off of any Toyota or Honda, just like the gauge cluster. It's kind of weird to see where Lambo decided to go uncrazy for a few components, but they certainly didn't go uncrazy under here. Behold the magical V12, 6.2 liter V12, 570 horsepower mounted in the middle. It is very, very cool to see. And something I always have loved is how Lamborghini puts the firing order right on the engine. Even though it's not necessary, it is a cool detail. It's always neat to pop open a Lamborghini engine cover and see the firing order of the cylinders. Very cool. Now, since we're in the engine compartment, I also like this warning label under here that says, when the car is not being used for a period of a month or more to avoid difficulties, make sure to put it on a battery tender. Oh, what kind of difficulties, Lambo? Oh, just difficulties. You know, avoid the difficulties. Stick on a battery tender. No difficulties then. <laughs> I like that vague term. Who knows what might happen if you don't follow the instructions. And finally, moving into the front trunk, you can see front trunk is not especially large in this car, and it's even smaller with the added aftermarket stereo equipment in here. Nothing particularly interesting or unusual or noteworthy in this front trunk. It just kind of underscores that this car is not very practical. And so that's a tour of the ridiculousness that is the Lamborghini Murcielago Roadster. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Murcielago Roadster. You know, I just think this car is crazier than the Aventador. I love the Aventador, but this thing just still feels to me like it has more of a sense of occasion. Everybody seems to love the Lambo that was around when they grew up. This car came out when I turned 14, so to me it's the Diablo and this. These are my Lambos, if you will. The driving position is terrible. You're actually tilted a little to the right. You're angled a little bit, and the pedals are especially angled. The pedals are way offset. Uh, very small pedal box over to the right. Difficult to get your feet in there. The shifts are surprisingly not as bad as I was expecting. You know, this old school sequential manual Ferrari F1 transmissions, Maserati Cambio Corsa, they're all terrible. This actually isn't so bad. The visibility behind you is absolutely terrible. Uh, the engine cover kind of comes up, hard for you to see, but it hides basically anybody behind you. You really can't see much. Wow. Acceleration still feels really strong and you hear so much. 
I know this car isn't as fast as some of the latest dual clutch stuff. It's probably not even as fast as a 458, but it feels it. You have that sense of occasion, that angry, naturally aspirated V12 right behind you. And it sounds like an old school car. I feel like this thing sounds more like the Espada, the Harama, the Lamborghinis from old than the modern ones do. The modern ones sound great, but this just has an amazing note to it. Woo! Wow. Wow. Yeah, it's quick. The only, the only problem with the acceleration is that it is dulled by those shifts, but it's a very quick car. Wow. Steering is good. Again, nicely weighted, feels really good. It's got a good feel to it. Woo! <laughs> Man, this thing is just a ton of fun. It's a total blast. And I'll tell you, when you're driving it, you just think about how it looks from the outside. You think about how it sounds, how it feels, how well it's taking corners. And you don't care about how the power lock button is where the window switch should be. It doesn't matter. And that's the point of a Lambo. It's horribly designed, but it looks so cool and it drives so well. You don't care. And so that's the Lamborghini Murcielago Roadster. By the time this car came out, the Volkswagen Group already owned Lamborghini, and it was clearly a push toward making a more rational car. But it still had some crazy quirks and some unorthodox details and an explosive driving experience, and I'm thrilled that I got the chance to share it with you. And now it's time to give this car a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Murcielago Roadster looks really, really cool. Not as classically beautiful as some, but breathtaking nonetheless, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Acceleration 0 to 60 is 3.7 seconds, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Handling is excellent, though not quite as sharp as smaller, more nimble, or more modern exotics, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Fun factor is huge, especially with the open roof, and it gets a 9 out of 10. Cool factor is also huge, as this will make just about anyone stop and stare, and it gets a 9 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 41 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. The Murcielago Roadster has enough stuff, but not a lot of good new tech, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Comfort is pretty rough, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Quality is fine, though I'd worry about reliability unless I was Tavarish, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality is incredibly low, with very little trunk space and a basically unusable top. This should probably get a 1, but I'll be generous here, and I'll give it a 2 out of 10. Finally, value, and these are reasonably priced for what they are. They're still in that U used car phase before they enter the phase of cool vintage Lamborghini that everyone wants. So they offer a lot of crazy supercar for the money, and it gets a 7 out of 10 for a total daily score of 22 out of 50. Add it up and the Doug score is 63 out of 100, which places it here against rivals from the same era. The Murcielago Roadster does well in the weekend categories, but it gets destroyed in the daily score. It's just really not a very rational, practical car to use with any frequency, which is is kind of the point. Wow. Whoa. Wow. Yeah.